Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our first programming post our opening ceremony. Thank you to DDG Judy Beaumont for representing the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment and for opening our bird fair. We're very excited to be bringing you our second ever installment of this virtual fair. Before we get into our next session, our first keynote speaker will be broadcast at 7 p.m. South African time. That's GMT plus two. Dr. Melissa Whitecross of BirdLife South Africa and Martin Harper of BirdLife International will be interviewing Chris Packham, CBE. Chris is a British naturalist and broadcaster famous for his BBC documentaries and conservation action and advocacy. He will be sharing some of his experiences on set and on the front lines of conservation in Africa and across the world. You will not want to miss this session. Please note that our two keynote presentations as well as our three workshops tomorrow all require the purchase of a ticket. You can purchase your ticket by using the purchase ticket function on the left hand side menu of our platform. Alternatively, you can search this event on crickets.com. Each ticket is 100 Rand per event, that's about seven US dollars, and the proceeds of this will be used to support Birdlife South Africa's work. There is also a donate option which can be used, and donations to Birdlife South Africa of more than 500 Rand are tax deductible for South African tax citizens. Now onto the presentation at hand. Fancy Peacock is a well-known birder, artist and ornithologist in South Africa. He is known particularly for the bird books that he has co-authored and produced, including the latest Sassol Birds of Southern Africa and his two exceptional Chamberlain's guides to LBJs and waders. We all know Fancy is an extremely talented man, but his powers of observation are not only key for his artwork and curation of bird specimens, but also for his undercover comedic skills. Tonight, Fancy takes a light-hearted look at what makes birders tick, a fascinating and also hilarious self-diagnosis of all the crazy behaviors of birders the world over. Please enjoy. And sometimes in animal encounters on the PGA Tour. Look at our camera captured uh, just a short time ago, a falcon or hawk or whatever it is, developing an affection for one of our microphones. He is better. I mean, look at this. He's moved it all around the green. Now he flat, whoop. Yep, 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 we've got it. We have liftoff. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Wow. <laughs> Does that count as an official? heard about the town of Miamal. If you're a birder, of course you have. If not, it's a small charming hamlet in the eastern free state, surrounded by pristine grasslands and wetlands, and it offers some of the rarest and most localized birds our country has to offer. 
So when I was a bit younger, I learned that the family of a girl that I kind of knew actually had a farm at Niemel. In fact, the farm was right up on top of the plateau where you could wake up and hear Rudd's logs calling all around you. Um, so one thing led to another, and before you could say hetero marafra radai, I was best friends with this girl. And consequently, I spent much of my early 20s exploring the ridges and plains and valleys of this farm. But on this particular weekend, we had had a horrible time. Um, the weather was cold and, and drizzly and misty. Um, and in fact, it was so cold that all the water pipes had frozen solid. So we had to strain and boil water from the cattle drinking troughs. Um, and to make matters worse, we actually we had a little car accident one afternoon on the way back from birding at Circuit Flay Nature Reserve. So with dusk descending fast, we came over a blind rise and in the road were all these crowned cranes. And sort of partly out of shock and partly out of awe from this amazing sighting, we went off the road at about 80 kilometers an hour. We went down the embankment on the side and ramped up um, on the other side and we actually ramped clear over the farm fence. So once we sort of stopped bouncing through the millies, we made sure that everyone was okay and no one was too seriously injured. But now the immediate problem was that we were inside some farmer's field and there was no way to get back out into the road. So with two burst tires, we sort of slowly plodded through the fields until we could find a, a, a farm gate. So with all this drama, I thought that maybe a good way to unwind would be to go and look for Cape Eagle Owls. Um, and we went to sort of a rocky cliff area um, in one of the valleys where I thought it looked like pretty good habitat. Um, so we were three people, but during the search, our party had sort of split up. And then at one point, uh, Runel and I heard a, like, a, like a distant muffled thump. Oof. Um, and we, we went off in that direction. We found our friend, uh, who was a non-birder, but he sort of went along to see what this whole birding thing is all about. We found him sitting at the base of a small cliff and um, looking very sort of disheveled and embarrassed. I found your owl, he said, um, but with, uh, with less enthusiasm than, than you would uh, typically use at a sighting of this amazing bird. Uh, but then I fell down this cliff. So anyway, <clears throat> while he was uh, tumbling down the rocks, fortunately he had the foresight to, to see where the owl had flown to, and he pointed out, out a large, big, flat rock on the other side of the valley. So without further ado, I took off my brightly colored shirt and my shoes, and I started creeping towards this rock um, like Gollum um, if follow, following his precious. Um, so anyway, fight, fighting my way silently through the brambles and the bracken, I eventually arrived at the base of this rock. And then came the ascent, so, sort of millimeter by agonizing millimeter, I lifted my head until my eyes cleared the rock and I was looking into her, um, her glowing orange eyes like twin suns boring into me. So that moment really stretched for what felt like weeks, like months or years. It felt, um, you know, it was like a half a second in reality, but, but it felt like I had a real connection with that owl. Like we'd sort of strolled on the Champs-Élysées together, and we discovered the source of the Nile, or watched breakfast at Tiffany's on a rainy morning. I think that, that's what I felt. I think the owl felt mostly surprised. So spreading her huge mottled wings, she took off down the valley and flew back towards her original roosting spot. But as she was flying, she sort of glanced back over her shoulder as if to say, Fancy, I'll never forget you. And I know I certainly won't forget that moment until my dying day. Hi, I'm Fancy Peacock. And yes, that is my real name. Perhaps it was my destiny to become a professional birder or maybe um, it was just a happy coincidence. Either way, I'm named after the most beautiful bird in the world, the peacock, which is a real honor. Um, and perhaps that's where it all started. Um, but today I want to talk to you about what was that, that electric thrill that I felt when I saw that Cape Eagle Owl. Why did I feel so connected in that moment? I mean, it's just a bird after all. Or was it? So I am a bird brain. Uh, I eat, drink, breathe, sleep, and even dream birds. And I'm sure many of you do too. And for those who don't yet, I would suggest that you sign off right now, close your browser, switch off your computer and just get out. Because once you're in, uh, there's no escape. Um, and that is, you know, unless you want to spend the rest of your life um, either consciously or subconsciously looking for birds, identifying them, cataloging them, um, you know, even if it's just from the corner of your eye. 
You will spend every last cent that you have on bird optics and bird books. Um, your, all your holidays will be planned around gaps in your life list. Okay? And this will take you to some dream destinations like Somalia or um, the Arctic Circle, Kazakhstan. Um, and you will wake up at unholy hours of the, of the morning, especially on weekends, believe it or not. And you'll develop a whole new language with questionable words like um, dip and string and bogey and lifer and mega. And you might move to the Western Cape, not because of the political stability, but because of the proximity of some amazing rarities hotspots like Strandfontein and the West Coast National Park. And you'll also eventually lose um, interest in all the sort of secular things, um, politics, food, sports, and really anything that's not about birds. And you'll have to feign interest in these things when you talk to, um, uh, to, to normal people, aka okay, non-birders. <clears throat> On the plus side, you'll become part of a strange community of like-minded people um, with questionable sanity, I'll admit. Um, you'll have a lifetime's worth of adventures, like, like the time I had to change the tire in Kruger National Park with a pride of lions on one side and a leopard on the other. Um, you will travel to pretty much everywhere many times. Um, you'll learn to just to, to look up. Um, your eyesight and your hearing will become a lot sharper. Uh, you will learn to take a shit in the bush. And you will learn to rejoice in small little mundane things like a, like a sparrow hopping under your chair at your local restaurant. You will spend many happy hours um, discussing the primary projection on a second calendar year lesser black black girl with your birding mice and you'll actually meet people who understand what that last sentence means. In fact, over time this specialized inter-birder communication is one of the skills that we become real experts at. Um, and one of the times that that manifests best is when we're describing a bird's color, right? So we, can, we birders can distinguish subtly different hues of color with accuracy that would put Picasso to shame. And we can describe this with language that would make, make Shakespeare shake. I mean, tawny, buff, russet, cinnamon, fleshy, ochre, chestnut, these all really just mean the same thing, don't they? And I mean, do normal people actually ever have the, uh, you know, find a, somewhere in life to use these words? I doubt it. I mean, when would you possibly uh, need to distinguish colors to this degree. Um, yes, I like the, the olive gray hatchback, but um, the extra horsepower that comes with the sooty ash model might be useful when I'm trying to make a cinnamon buff traffic light before it turns bright chestnut. <laughs> In fact, the only word that birders don't use is brown. Um, this is akin to a wine connoisseur calling a, a particular year a uh, particular year's wine um, uh, whiny. You know, it's... Um, you, you're welcome to combine brown with other other words. You can you can say brownish gray or buffy brown or whatever the case might be. In fact, if someone ever wanted to publish um, a racy novel for birders, I think the perfect title would be Fifty Shades of Brown. And incidentally, that's one of the titles I considered for my for my LBJ's book, uh, that or Ornithologicum Nightmariensis. Um, so another skill that birders um, excel at is letting other birders know where a particular bird is. Um, and as such, we can descri describe completely inanimate objects like rocks and trees and bushes and mountains with um, the precision of a German engineer. And of course, the rarer the bird is, the greater the pressure to get all the other birders onto it. Um, so this is the point where there's an instant um, distinction between a birder and a non-birder through sort of vocal and behavioral characters. Okay, so, so a non-birder would, would almost invariably point frantically, uh, which invariably causes the bird to flush, um, which is to say to fly away, not, not to finish up in the loose. Um, or they can say one of the worst possible things, it's there or it's right there, or it's out in the open. And then of course, oh, it's gone. It just flew. Rather, a good birding mate would um, dive uh, deep into those long hours in preschool where they learned shapes and colors. And a typical scenario would, would go something like this. Do you see the green tree? Um, which green tree? The jade green or the emerald green? No, 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 the green trapezoid one, the teal green one. Okay, so you go up with the main trunk then you take the second big fork to the left, then it splits again, 
um, and there are some lichens that look like octagons. Have you got it? No, 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 no. It's the, is it the diagonal fork or the more horizontal fork? So some of the, the best descriptions that I've heard, and these are, are the bite and true quotes, um, were, it's by the rock that looks like a triangular square. So what on earth is a triangular square? Okay, the second one is, um, it's, it's by the cow with a map of Madagascar on its side. And my favorite, um, it's, by, it's in the bush that looks like a vagina. And of course, this last one was by a guy. And uh, all the other guys in the birding group got onto the bird immediately. <clears throat> so in fact, I think the, the connection between, between birds and sexuality is quite profound. Um, I don't think I'll mention any specific examples, but I'm sure you can think of some slang words that, that are bird related. Um, and my bird brain theory is that um, the part of us that appreciates the, the beauty of birds is sort of right next to the, the part in the human brain um, that's associated with sexuality. And this gives us a sort of almost voyeuristic um, desire to, to observe these creatures. And by creatures, I mean birds, not, not girls. So like, like techno-savvy peeping toms, we creep around the bushes with long lenses and, and microphones and binoculars. Um, you know, I don't see anything wrong with that, but I know that many an overzealous security guard might argue differently. And then there's that old chestnut, so to speak, that I uh, heard so many times as a young birder. Um, oh, you're going birding, hey? I'm uh, going to look at the two-legged kind, wink, wink. Um, two-legged kind as opposed to, what, four-legged birds? I mean, if you, if you really have to, at least be biologically accurate and say something like the feathered kind. But yes, that's what it, what it comes down to. I'm going to go out and study these magnificent globe-crossing flighted creatures descended from the dinosaurs while uh, our mammalian ancestors were scuffling about in the dirt. And perhaps um, our evolutionary history can also explain why we feel this connection to birds and why it's so elemental. Because doesn't birding fulfill both our desires for hunting and gathering? I mean, typically male birders would be the sort of modern day hunters. They'll go to the ends of the earth in pursuit of their quarry. But um, the only difference is instead of sticking a, a dead head on their living room wall, um, they make a little tick in their notebooks and they post something on Facebook. Female birders are sort of a rarer sighting, although by no means um, less serious or, or, or less capable than males of the species. However, they do tend to go about their gathering in a sort of more, slightly more sensible fashion. Um, but due to the skewed sex ratio, sex ratio between males and females of the species, the, the sort of single ready to mingle female birder is one of the most sought after ticks in the birding community, um, particularly if she's under 30 or so. And I, I, I dare say that um, gripping one of these girls, and, and, and by the way, gripping is a, is a birding term, so don't get too excited, um, is on par with seeing a major mega tick, um, something that young male birders might happily dip on an African, African golden oriole for, perhaps even an African broadbill, you know, if she's pretty. Um, but definitely not dip on something like an, like an African pitta. Um, bottom line is, uh, uh, ticks before chicks, right? So, birding can actually um, solidify a lifelong happy relationship if both parties are into it. And as long as one doesn't spot a life while the other steps behind a bush. In fact, I know of a birding couple who broke up because the, the guy cheated on the girl with a gullible turn. Um, it's, uh, but I suspect it's, it's probably gullible to, I'm sorry, to think there weren't some underlying issues there. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, if only one spouse is a bird, I foresee some problems. And particularly if, if they're part of a very specific subspecies of bird called twitcheri, um, in, case, in which case you're looking at a lifetime of negotiation and compromise. Um, what, what do you mean you have to fly to PE again? You just got back. Um, let, let me explain this, um, this last part a, a, a little bit more clearly. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine found um, an odd-looking plover at Tankatara Salt Works outside Port Elizabeth, or whatever it's called now. It, turn, it turned out this little thing was actually a, a little ring plover. 
Uh, but then on that same evening, I got a voice note saying that um, there's also now a citrine wagtail at the same site. So now there were these two sort of adrenaline-inducing, bad language-spearing, last-minute flight booking rarities, um, just a short hop across the country. <clears throat> and so without much delay, birders descended on, on, on Port Elizabeth like twins to beavers to a bus. Um, and it's all good, and they got nice sightings of these birds, and they returned to, to work uh, on Monday with uh, happy memories. But here's the, the kick in the cloaca. So while there, um, someone photographed a little warbler, sort of unconcernedly catching midges in the surrounding bushes. And after some very frantic back and forth WhatsApping, we figured out that this was actually a new species for the region, Upchus warbler. And so you know how, how beginner birders or, or non-birders are always saying they saw something that's not in the book, or that actually always is in the book? Well, in this case, this bird wasn't in the book. So now, all these switches are just come back from Port Elizabeth were faced by what is arguably, arguably the, 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 the most pressing dilemma in the history of, of local birding, uh, whether to fly back to that same spot just two days later. So I suspect that the 1st of September 2017 will forthwith always be known as Unhappy Wives Day in South Africa. But this little story is testament to the, uh, the unpredictability of birds and consequently the the instant need for mobility that um, serious twitches require. So, I mean, just as you're sitting down to watch your, to catch up on some of your favorite TV shows, your phone pings and it's Trevor telling you that you have to be halfway across the country at dawn the next morning. And I mean, that could be anywhere. It could be an uh, open lot in suburban Maputo for a redneck stint. It could be the parking lot of Victoria Falls Airport for a pied weed year. Could be a boat circling around uh, 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 Robber Island in Mosul Bay for a, a greater sheath bill. And I mean, that's just um, in the space of a, of a few weeks in summer. Um, so these uh, serious twitches, they tend to rack up a lot of um, Kalula.com frequent flyer miles. And then each time you go on these twitches, you ask yourself, um, why am I doing this? I don't have the time or the money for this. And you can never have both, right? Um, but I don't think it's only about adding another tick to your list. Um, it's sort of it's sort of buying into a little piece of birding history, right? Becoming um, part of the um, it's it's sort of a, a ring of fireside stories about these um, exciting birds and making last minute plans to travel and to see them. I mean, look, I appreciate a nice dingy stint at the Sewage Works as much as the next guy, but I think. Um, it's all about the thrill of the, the chase, and the greater the distance, the bigger the risk that you're going to miss it, uh, the bigger the thrill. At least that's what I told myself as the plane touched down in Cape Town International for Fancy Peacock's day off. And sure enough, when we got to Strangfontein Sewage Works, um, there was a promising line of scopes already trained on the wetland. And like a good little boy, the, the Temming stint was performing like a champ. Um, in fact, after soaking up every feather in exquisite detail, I actually got a little blasé about the whole thing. Um, and then a group of newbie birders arrived. You could tell they were beginners by how pristine their binoculars are, because um, uh, sort of advanced birders, <clears throat> their binoculars are sort of held together with duct tape and all scratched up, and you would have a better view through like a two-liter bottle of Sprite. But anyway, so these, um, these guys came up to us and, and I explained where the stint was and the same little patch of ooze that it's been probing the whole morning. Um, <clears throat> but the more I explained about the behavior and how to identify it and all the diagnostic features, the more they insisted they couldn't see this bird. And, you know, I didn't even bother looking because I know I knew exactly where it was sitting. Uh, but of course, Murphy's Law, uh, it had flown off and a little stint had come in and, and, and replaced it in exactly the same spot. Uh, of course, my birding buddy, he'd already seen what was going on and he was sniggering um, and that's how I sort of figured out my mistake. And this all happened in the same week that I launched my book on the identification of waders. I mean, I could have died. But one justification for twitching um, and birding in general is that it encourages you and, and, and by encourages, I mean it forces you to visit places that you would never ever have seen otherwise. Um, you know, as a beginner birder, you can have a royal time at your at your local bird sanctuary or perhaps your annual trip to Kruger National Park. But soon you'll um, start yearning to explore further, um, to go where the birds are. 
And while a lot of birds are, are everywhere, even more of them are almost nowhere. So before you know it, you'll find yourself chasing red larks in parts of the Northern Cape that make a puffer that look like Pretoria. Um, and you'll make a pilgrimage to Ngoya Forest in KZN to go and see the aptly named and spectacularly dull green barbet. And you might even find yourself traipsing up Mount Gorongosa in Mozambique, the, the only local home of the neo-mythical green-headed oriole. In fact, I would go as far as to say that there is no other group in society uh, that is as well traveled and as sort of geographically literate as birders are. I mean, have you ever experienced that magical moment when you're standing in, at some random place on some random farm on some random school day in the middle of nowhere, a million miles from your job and your responsibilities and your secular life, and you sort of ask yourself, how did I get here? And I, I mean, I don't mean that literally, although the uh, the Google Maps study might have given up long ago, but I'm sure you know exactly where you are to the decimal degree. But just sort of that ex that experience of where am I and how did I get you? What am I doing here? And that's to me, that's one of the most magical times in birding. So in that la last sort of paragraph, I painted a, a tranquil picture of, of mankind being in balance with, with nature. And I will now shatter that by bringing up the, the dreaded owl word listing. So all birders are obsessive and almost oh, they have an almost autistic fondness for making lists and we've perfected it to a science. Um, and okay so for the uninitiated I'll start with the very basics. Okay you write down a list of birds that you saw. You can then subdivide that list in various ways. So let's start with geography. Okay so you could say your world list, your southern African list, your South Africa list, your provincial list, um, your garden list, and then the garden list you can even divide into birds that you see in the garden and birds that you see from the garden, right? Okay, you can also apply a time period to your listing. Um, <clears throat> so, a typical one would be the trip list, of which the inverse is the target list, okay? You could have a year list, a day list, or the big boy, your life list. And by the way, birders, birders, we don't die, we just finish our life lists. Um, <clears throat> there are also various record types that you can attribute to your list. The first question, and one that causes a lot of psychological turmoil in birders, is whether something is tickable or not. Tickable, how is that even a word? Um, and what does it mean? Uh, well, um, forget, li uh, forget relationships and true love and making a difference in the world. Life is or what makes uh, life worth living, but only if they're tickable, okay? So um, birds that are not tickable would be things that have escaped from cap captivity or species that are um, pending taxonomic splits or lumps um, and have not yet been accepted by some committee of bird nerds. Okay, so if they are split, then you get, you get what is called an armchair tick, which sort of implies that when birders are not out birding, they're sitting in armchairs. Um, but if all these lists are not quite enough to, uh, to satisfy your OCD, many people also uh, create their own lists. Um, and really, your imagination is the only limit. Birds that I've seen from the bathroom window, birds that I've seen while driving to work, birds that I've seen on TV, birds that my cat have caught, uh, birds that I've seen while traveling at more than 100 kilometers an hour, which is how I will die, by the way, one day, uh, and birds that I've dreamed about. Um, this, this one is mine. In fact, last night I added uh, a go-away bird, although in retrospect that might have been my wife just commenting on, on my snoring. Um, at one stage I got my, my actuary uh, brother, actuary, not actually, I'm pretty sure he is my brother, uh, to do a little calculation for me. So by factoring in the average lifespan of a birder um, on all the various lists I keep, he came up with a total of 4,371 lists in your lifetime. And of course, this necessitates an additional list, which is the list of lists. Uh, and incidentally, that's what LOL stands for, right? Um, you will meet people who, who insist that they don't keep lists. Okay, So these people are either lying, or they've got amazing memories, or they're just too lazy to write it all down. 
or perhaps they recently had a hard drive crash or like a house fire. I'm not sure which one of those two would be worse. Um, but adding a, numer a numerical qualifier to your hobby is quite dangerous um, as it invites competition, right? But a good dose of healthy competition is also what makes birding fun. Um, so for example, Bird Life South Africa's annual uh, birding big day. On a specific day in late November, teams of three or four birders race around a 50 kilometer radius and they try and see how many birds they can identify either by sight or sound. Um, you know, without exception on that day, one is so excited that there's no sleep beforehand. So instead you just sit watching the, the cold blue face of your phone waiting for it to turn midnight so you can start ticking off um, insomniac birds. And by sunrise, the top teams already have, you know, 150 odd birds on their, on their list. And the, the Twitch-a-thon continues non-stop throughout the day. Um, bathroom breaks have to be taken within earshot so that everyone can confirm the calls. There's no slowing down for like speed traps or potholes or anything. And then, you know, after 24 hours, by the following midnight, you're so exhausted. Um, you're eking out a few remaining uh, long shots, maybe like a, a sleeping garoo thrush in someone's garden or, or whatever. And you, you're jittery and you're wired. You finally count up the total and you share a brief slap on the back and then you promptly pass out. But now my question to you is, riddle me this. Given all the intensity of this competition and the lack of sleep and uh, the hyped up team spirit, are you 100% sure that all the day's records are legit? I mean, could you perhaps have agreed a little too quickly on something flashing across the road? Um, uh, that distant female ringtail harrier, you know, are you really sure that it was a pallet and not a Montague's? Or um, could it not maybe have been a Cape Robin chat imitating a green headed oriole in your garden? Um, <clears throat> so one of the first questions that non-birders typically ask is how do they know you're not cheating? Well, the truth is they don't. Firstly, there's not really any they, there's no panel that vets your records. We actually all just work on the good old um, honor system. Well, firstly, the incentive to cheat is really low because there's no prize money. Um, and secondly, if you do cheat and you're caught out, uh, you'll be scorned for the rest of your birding career. Look, while we all make honest mistakes, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, deliberate cheating is something quite different. But often I think that the, the cheating is not necessarily by malicious intent. It's just that some birders seem to have a, a better imagination than others. They just seem like unnaturally lucky. Okay? But if this happens over and over, uh, there's a special term that we apply to these sorts of birders. And now I have to say naughty words, okay? Naughty words are kids, kids, please cover your ears, okay? So those birders are labeled stringers, stringers. And that's, that word will be inscribed on your tomb, tombstone. And it's a fate worse than dipping out on a scare swift. You see, birders, they tend to uh, project this image. They like to project this image to the world that they're peaceful, pacifist, patient, kind-hearted, nature-loving, intelligent, trustworthy people. And sure, there are these sort of Ellen DeGeneres type birders, but where's the fun in that? And in, instead, I think, and this stays just between us, right, is that I think that most birders are highly competitive and skeptical and cynical and jealous and gossipy and volatile. Um, and if you don't believe me, consider this little story. So, say um, <clears throat> your somewhat less experienced birding buddy, say Justin Nicolau comes up to you and he says, um, that he just saw a, a pal's fishing owl. Um, <clears throat> is your response A, wow, that's wonderful, congratulations. Or is your response B, where? Of course you're going to say where, right? And now say in reply, <clears throat> he tells you that um, this pal's fishing owl was in a suburb of Cape Town. So now is your reply a sort of diplomatic, oh wow, that's interesting, I wonder how it got there. That's, that's, that's unbelievable. Or is your response to immediately start um, theorizing on possible mistakes that he could have made or alternatives? You know, maybe a kid was playing with his big uh, gingery teddy bear and he was jumping on the trampoline and the teddy bear flew out of his hand and it got stuck in the tree. And it, it did sort of look like a pal's fishing owl, you know, especially at night. Anyone could make that mistake. I mean, it's, it's funny, right? But if, if, you, if we're being serious, I mean, that teddy bear explanation almost sounds a little bit more realistic than seeing a, a pals fishing owl in Cape Town. 
in the Cape Town suburb. Uh, but this, this peer review process is what keeps us from cheating. Well, peer review and then Facebook comments. Um, and there really was a KPR, uh, uh, pal switching owl in Cape Town a few years ago. We, we don't know how it got there. Maybe it hitched a ride on a ship from West Africa. I guess we'll never know. But say that you did make an, an, an honest mistake. Okay, so say you misidentified a chirping cesticular as a singing cesticular. Um, perhaps, perhaps you were just too lazy to check all the features and now, now it's left you red-faced or, or, or even wailing. So, sorry, okay, I'll stop that now. Um, so what is your best option then to save face? What can you do in a case like this? I'm going to teach you a sure fire five-step plan to, to save face. Um, and I'm so getting booted off the rarities committee for this. But anyways, here we go. So step one, you claim there were two birds. Easy enough. Or um, you could claim it was some sort of genetic aberration that caused abnormal plumage. That's always a good go-to. Or you could simply just drop a lot of jargon. If you sound like you know what you're talking about, people tend to believe you. You know, Clearly the vestigial first primary feather extends beyond the imagination on the second, um, secondary cupboard. You know, something like that. Um, fourthly, you could try and bribe some uh, influential experts to rally your case online. Or five, uh, fifthly, uh, Photoshop, and I've said. Um, but what is I what is I talking about? Oh yes, yeah, so that's another thing about bird is we always seem distracted. Right? So that's because we're always we are distracted because we're always scanning for birds. You know, we're always listening and watching for movement and that sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> that's just our cross to bear, I'm afraid. But I do have some advice on that point, and, and that is if you ever, in an important situation, you have to concentrate, say you're on a, on a first date or a, on a, in a court hearing or something like that, my advice is always choose a seat that's not facing a window, right? Um, or like when you're sitting, sitting down for a job interview. Um, yes, I believe I'm the, the perfect candidate for the job. Uh, my biggest weakness? Probably that I work too hard, whereas you're actually thinking that your biggest weakness is turns or maybe non-reading weavers. Um, I would describe myself as detail-orientated, meticulous, a good observer. Hobbies? Uh, nothing too serious. I do kind of like making lists. Um, where do I see myself in five years? Well, probably... Raptor! 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 So if you're thinking that all of this sounds a bit ridiculous and freakish, there's hope for you yet. But if it sounds pretty normal to you, then I have some bad news. Um, you will never lead a normal life. You will be a bird brain, just like me, just like all the other people signed in and listening today. And you will be until the day in which you finish your life list. Thank you. Thank you, Fancy, for sharing all your hilarious stories, um, anecdotes, and observations. I must say, quite a few of those hit very close to home. Up next is the first of our keynote speakers, the inimitable Chris Packham, at 7 p.m. South African time. Please remember to purchase your tickets, which are 100 Rand, approximately 7 US dollars, and to add on a donation if you are so inclined. Please also make sure you are properly logged in and can see the option for the talk on the left-hand side platform menu. Thank you to our platform sponsors, MSC Cruises, the AA, Ital Tile, Ford Wildlife Foundation and Zeiss for supporting the bird bear this year. While you're waiting to hear Chris's interview, please visit our exhibitor and sponsor booths, participate in our bird search game, bid on our silent auction, and if you are not yet a member of BirdLife South Africa, you can take advantage of the bird fair special where you will not only get a discounted rate, but also stand a chance of winning a pair of Zeiss binoculars. I will see you all back here for Chris's interview at 7 p.m.